jazz music as we know it today, but they hadn't been a Louis Armstrong. Anyone you talk to is going to say the same thing. This is nothing new. Except I don't think that he started out to do all of this. He just started out to be a guy that liked to play a trumpet. And uh, but it was so overwhelming that the whole world followed him. And, uh, and then he became an entertainer and this and that. It's really unexplainable. That was the distinguished pianist, Nat Pierce, talking about Louis Armstrong. I always loved jazz. It's a music that's completely straightforward. You don't have to know anything beforehand. Nothing needs to be explained. It comes at you direct with its springing rhythm and its overflowing improvised melody. The style that has made most impression on people was and still is what's known today as traditional or Dixieland jazz. It grew out of the American South and was heard in early years on the Mississippi River boats and also at dances, picnics, weddings and funerals. The greatest player at this style of music, as it was, and as we know it today, remains Louis Armstrong. Louis was born in the red light district of New Orleans in Louisiana, probably a few years before the turn of the century. According to one story, he started to learn the trumpet at the age of 12 in a reformatory. Jazz was then a music of low social standing to be heard in brothels and slums as well as riverboats. With that determination and sense of direction which so many fine artists have shown, Armstrong brought himself and jazz out of the gutter and the ghetto. More than anyone else, he made it an important and self-sufficient branch of music. Armstrong's brilliant tone and command of his instrument gave him enormous influence on his fellow trumpeters, but his skill in improvisation meant that players of other instruments learned from him too, even pianists. He was the acknowledged master. By a happy accident, his personality was warm, cheerful, humorous and friendly. The combination was irresistible. He was the perfect ambassador for his music and in time for his country too. Where the politicians had failed, Armstrong succeeded and he and his band were sent to all corners of the globe to break the ice and make new friends. They were as wild a success in Africa and Japan as they were in Europe and other old stamping grounds. Louis was admired by presidents, kings, princes and even popes but also, it's important to say, by people of all backgrounds and levels of culture, all ages, all classes. Nobody was ever closer to being a universally popular figure as well as a great artist. With all that, he remained a busy, conscientious professional musician, doing his best for the folks every night. This film is by way of a tribute to Armstrong from some of the people who were closest to him in mind and spirit, his former sidemen or friends. With each player, with one exception, now entering his twilight years, this could be the last record made of the reminiscences of him by such great musicians as Arvel Shaw, Armstrong's bass player for nearly 25 years and a close friend and associate, and the irrepressible 73-year-old drummer Barrett Deems, whose energy and control are a model of drum play and who was a mainstay of Armstrong's all-stars for eight years. Together, they still make one of the most driving rhythm sections in jazz. Then there's Johnny Mintz, born in Chicago in 1912, already a brilliant professional clarinetist at the age of 17. His playing has enhanced the orchestras of Ray Noble, Bob Crosby and Tommy Dorsey, and he accompanied Armstrong over the years on many of his studio performances, plus a stint with the All-Stars towards the end. Nat Pierce, whose ability as an arranger and pianist is much acclaimed and whose career has brought him into collaboration with some of the greatest names in jazz. Nat had been approached to join the All-Stars just before Louis' death, but unhappily, that was never to be. Louis' All-Stars had two great trombonists during the course of its existence. The first, the Texan, Jack Teagarden, was a personal friend of Bob Havens, who appears on trombone in this film. Jack died in the early 60s and had been replaced in Armstrong's All-Stars by Trummy Young. Trummy sadly died four weeks before this European tour, and the band were quick to recruit Bob Havens, who spent his formative years in Louis' hometown of New Orleans, playing with Al Hurt and Pete Fountain. Ironically, he went on to spend 22 years as star soloist with the Lawrence Welk Orchestra, not really a jazz band, but is thought by working musicians to be the finest Dixieland trombonist around today. But perhaps the most surprising aspect of the band is that the principal instrument, the trumpet, is played by an Englishman, Keith Smith. At the tender age of 20, with Louis as his inspiration, Keith emigrated to New Orleans, where he managed in those days of segregation to get himself into the Black Musicians' Union. This acceptance enabled him to play with marching bands in carnivals, at funerals, clubs, and plantation home functions, with such as the Eureka Brass Band, and also with Armstrong's former friend and drummer, Paul Barberin. 
Keith flourished in New Orleans, soaking up the music and atmosphere. He eventually found himself playing alongside Louis's second wife, the pianist Lil Hardin Armstrong, in Chicago. He went on to perform and record with many of Louis's former sidemen and contemporaries, such as Pops Foster, Darnell Howard, George Lewis, Jimmy Archie, and Johnny Sincere. Having led many bands with great success, he decided a few years ago to get the Louis Armstrong All-Stars back together again. The resulting tour of the UK was a triumph. Described by the band as a natural successor to Louis, Keith treasures the title. He has made it his business to see that the Armstrong legend survives. So, this film is intended as a joyful evocation of Armstrong's life as remembered by some of those who knew him best. It was made in the northern part of England on the band's third UK tour. We follow them as they make their way to Scotland, playing to rapturous audiences along the way, while at the same time evoking the wonderful world of Louis Armstrong to the many thousands of people to whom Pops will always be the king of jazz. first experience with hearing them. I was crazy about the Guy Lombardo's band and everything. And uh, then one of my friends let me listen to this record of Louis Armstrong, and I was just stunned. And I couldn't believe anybody in the world could play like that. My father knew Louis Armstrong uh, years ago, even before I was born. took me to the Common Theater in St. Louis to see Louis Armstrong. He took me backstage and my father said, he wants to be a musician. You know, he says he wants to play in your band. Louis said, okay, when he gets old enough, bring him around, I'd like him in my band, so. Yeah, well, all these people, Darvel and Barrett and so on, you know, just got after Louis died, they went back to the, their hometowns. I just thought, well, you know, we really ought to try and continue with this spirit of music. It's so happy and it makes so many people happy. My mother collected a lot of uh, nice records. In my younger days, I was uh, given the opportunity to learn an instrument, and I chose the trombone. Among the records were a lot of Louis Armstrong records.
With practically every professional musician, traveling becomes a way of life. For the All-Stars, this has always been so. Throughout a long and illustrious career, each of them has visited virtually every corner of the globe, and the chance to see England again and play to enthusiastic audiences has been very welcome. It's natural, therefore, that they have many stories to tell of life on the road, none more so than Barry Deems and Arvel Shaw, the longer-serving members of the All-Stars. They cared greatly for Louis, and as Barry Deems explains, Louis's loyalty to them often knew no bad. Had a show to do, and they weren't allowed to use any white guys in those days. So they told Louis, you got to use another black drummer. And Louis said, no, this is my drummer. So then finally, Joe Glazer and him figured out something. Figured out something. <laughs> so they said, to, we'll make him use black up. So we put the black up on. Then we put black up, makeup. So Louis said, boy, you look great. So we did the show, and it took me two hours to get the makeup off, and I got on the plane, and I still didn't. I, I had it all over my face. We ended up in California with, make, with black makeup. <laughs> so when I got to the airport, all the black kids that I knew I did, they said, welcome to the race. <laughs> He was very full of, of joie de vivre, you know. He, when he checked into a, to a hotel, he would uh, always have uh, five rooms for himself, you know, one for his valet, one for his doctor, one for him and his wife, and two for his three girlfriends, you know. And, and that's one of the reasons why he was tired a lot, you know. That's running between five rooms, man. Check him for the joy. To a whole lot of joy, you know. Louis was had problems with the, the mob because the mob threatened to kill Louis and said, if you either work for us or you, or you don't work at all. Or you got, that's when the first time he came to England, 33. Yeah. He came because the, the mob was after him. The, the, you know, he wouldn't, couldn't work. Say, if you don't work for us, we'll kill you, you know? So he left the country and came to England, you know? Yeah. So when he went with Joe Glazer, Joe Glazer gave him protection. And also, they were good because they just had a handshake. They stayed yeah. together for 40 years now. And made each other yeah. rich. They made made each other millionaire. Yeah. And you notice Louis never had, like most guys, they had problems with internal yeah. revenue. Yeah. Louis, everything was always above board. Yeah. He protected Louis. And yeah. and Louis wound up a multi-millionaire and so did Joe Glazer. Yeah. Now, you can't beat that. Uh, How much did uh, you leave Louis? Four by million? Something like that. And he never left me a quarter. <laughs> <laughs>
the leader and arranger of the tour, meeting his idol for the first time was both memorable and humorous. He was introduced by the drummer Zutty Singleton during a Sunday concert in New York. It came this day, and I just couldn't wait to go and meet him. Eventually, we sort of uh, got to this theater, and I could hear this sound coming all through the theater of Louis sort of practicing and warming up. And eventually, when we got to the dressing room, Louis had sort of um, hardly anything on. He had some underpants. And uh, he was sort of sitting in his room, <laughs> practicing and crying out. Uh, eventually, anyway, Zutti came through the door, and, and uh, Louis and Zutti instantly sort of embraced, and everything. Like, great cuddling went on for about three minutes, and they sort of threw each other around the room. And uh, eventually, sort of Louis, when all this embracing stopped, and you know, Louis sort of saw me in the doorway. And then Zutti said, oh, that's a friend of mine. He's from London, England. He said, oh, London, England? Oh, yeah, you know Nat Canella? I said, oh, yes, of course, yes, yes. He said, he's a great friend of mine. Nat Canella and me were friends in the 1930s when I played at the Palladium. He's a wonderful trumpet player. Wonderful. He started to tell Zutti Singleton, he's a wonderful trumpet player from England. He said, we're old Londoner, you know. I said, how is he? I said, Oh, I think he's very well. Said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he had this hit wear talking. I said, What'd you say? So sort of shocked, you know. Sort of, What'd you say? I said, oh, uh, I was playing one of your records last night. It's a wonderful record. Uh, yeah, it's a wonderful record. And uh, yeah, it was really wonderful. I had this, um, had this drummer on it. It was a Big Sid Catley. He said, Oh, Big Sid. Yeah, my favorite drummer. Great drummer. Yeah, yeah. What'd you say? I said, Oh, um, uh, how is he? He said, he's dead. I said, oh, dead? What's wrong with him? He said, when you're dead, everything's wrong with you.
and uh, so that uh, we had to do this thing on television because that uh, Grammy Award thing, it was the best record of the year at MAME, see? So uh, the rehearsal uh, for me was that Louis turned around to me and said, well, Pop, you haven't done this, and I'll tell you how it goes. He says, uh, uh, yes, I, I sing the do, 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 <laughs> MAME, and you answers. And I said, well, I can do that. He said, well, let's go then. So that, then they started the television cameras rolling and everything, and now it comes to the part, and Louis singing, but da do 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 Mame, and I go, Mame. He says, stop. No, Bob, you don't sing some man, you play it. <laughs> Obsessed. As soon as I heard my first records of jazz, which was Louis Armstrong and the Maine, it just changed my life. I was just totally fascinated with that American art form. I was also fascinated with the South. I read everything of Mark Twain's, and I just bought every record that I could possibly afford. But as soon as I could, I mean, um, at 20, actually, um, I gave up the job and everything, you know, and uh, I just went off to live in the States, went to New Orleans to live there. I'm Well, it was just so much fun right from the beginning, really. I mean, from, from the first rehearsal, really, it was great. I met some out of fun. And uh, it was just a great joy. It was, so, it was so easy. I always find it so easy to play with these people. We just all sat in a room, and I just tapped my foot on the floor, and off we went. It was just amazing. It just all happened, and everyone just looked at each other after an hour or two and just said, it's going to work, and it did work. I never did meet Keith until when we got over and we had the first rehearsal. I was amazed to how... Uh, closely, he sounded like Armstrong. There's nobody in the States now who's still playing in the, what you what I would call the uh, Louis Armstrong, um, Roy Ellis tradition, you know. But Keith is amazing how he sounded uh, close to Armstrong. In fact, he's the closest the day of playing in the Armstrong style, you know. Now I'm working with Keith, and uh, that's the closest thing to Louis that I can imagine. Sometimes Keith will hit someone on nights, and, and no, he plays pretty good, Keith. And when he hits someone on night, I think it was, it was still playing with Louie on the road in one night. It's try to play with his band like I did with Louie.
amount saved up in my, my love account. I've decided that love divided in two just won't do. So I'm putting all my eggs in one, in one basket. I'm betting, I'm betting, I'm betting on you. They go to the dentist and get my chopper fixed. Yeah. So the guy didn't do a good job with the uh, bridge. So I go in the register and say, I want this, I want that. Everything got to be soft like mashed potatoes. He says, why? He said, I got summer teeth. He said, what? He said, summer teeth. Some are in, some are out. <laughs> I think we were in Trieste in Italy, you know. This is when Cozy Cole joined the band, you know. And for some reason, at first, Louie and Cozy didn't hit it off. They used to argue contenders about tempo and things, you know. And, you know, Louie thought he was a warrior, you know. He, you know, from New Orleans, from Street Kid, you know, he, he, he figured that he knew how to do it, and he, he didn't know how, you know. But, uh, 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 so, anyway, we were in Trieste, and just before the, the curtain went up, you know, we were on stage, and we had these white, beautiful tuxedos, you know. And we were standing there, and the, and the Italian, no, none of the Italian stagehands could speak a word of English, you know. And they were waiting for the signal, you know. And all of a sudden, Louis looked back, Cozy said, he said, man, for Christ's sakes, try to keep tempo for one time. And then Cozy said, what are you talking about? One time, I'm the best drummer, you know. And it, the thing went through that, and, it's, and the argument got hot, you know. And the state, Italian stagehands were waiting for the curtain to go up. And all of a sudden, Louis put his trumpet down and ran and grabbed Cozy and pulled him off the drums and they started rolling on the stage, swinging and fighting. They swung and fought for 20 minutes and didn't know nobody land a blow, man. Swish, 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 <laughs> swish. So the Italian stage here, they were standing there watching it. They thought this was the opening of the show. So they started bringing the curtain up. The curtain got slowly and Lloyd and Cozy all suits out dead and Lloyd looked outside the curtain going up, jumped up, down, down. Down, 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 down. They went through the whole first set, and the curtain came down. It started all over again, all, all over again, you know. Was, it, was that where you were in, were in Africa, where you wore these short trousers? You and Louis wore short trousers? India, somewhere. India? Yeah, I had on shorts, hot, and I got off the train in the broad, fainted. I said, what happened? He said, she thought you were Mahatma Gandhi. You know, <laughs> really went up to the Vatican. Yeah, yeah, we were 1949, you know, this is after the first time that Louis, after the Nice Festival, the first time we toured all, all of Europe. So uh, the band was creating such a sensation all over Europe until uh, it was just unbelievable because everybody had been waiting for us for years, you know, because so when we got to Rome, you know, uh, uh, the, you know, the publicity had went out in front that we'd been broadcasting all over Europe. So when we got to Rome, we played a concert and, and Pope Pius, who was Pope Pius, who was then the Pope, uh, sent for him to, uh, to talk to the band, you know, and uh, you know, for having an audience, you know. So he got in touch with the American uh, am ambassador. So they set it up for the press and all the diplomatic corps, the American ambassador, you know, and uh, the Italian ambassador, everybody was there, all the press, you know. So, uh, Louis, I mean, the Pope was asking Louis and Lucille about the, the life, his life, and everything, you know? So, when the Pope, uh, Pope Pius told him, Louis, that uh, when he was a young priest, you know, that how he had all of his records and he still had it, you know? Uh, how he was one of his fans, you know? So, uh, Louis was very pleased, you know? So, he asked Louis and Lucille, say, Mr. Armstrong, say, uh, uh, I, you and your wife, say, you we're very happy to, I'm very happy to have met you after all these years. Say, by the way, I mean, do, do you have any children? Louis said, no, but we're having a hell of a lot of fun trying, you know. <laughs> and that was shock silence for a minute, you know. And everybody looked at the Pope, you know, and the Pope was like this. He just, <laughs> and he let out a go for yuck, 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 And the house fell, the house came in, you know, and that was one of the, 
real great moments of the tour. <laughs> and he loved it, you know. But uh, only he could have gotten away with that, you know. The ambassador told him, say, Louis, that was close, but it, was, it came out great. It came out great. <laughs> and, and, Pope used to, uh, and Louis used to get a letter every year from Pope Pius. You know? And then, yeah. after the tour is over, yeah. Joe Glazer meets us whenever I'm at the airport. He said, now we relax. He said, that's great. I go home and see my wife. He said, but you got to be at MGM studio in 36 hours, 7 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> he said, what's this? He said, you're going to work. So yeah. I called my wife and told her, can't come through. She said, well, let me know when you get to Chicago sometime, but wear a red flower so I recognize you. <laughs> yes, the shark has pretty teeth, dear. And it shows them pearly white. Just that jackknife has my teeth, dear. And it keeps it out of sight. Ooh, when the shark bites with his teeth there, a scarlet billow starts to spread. Fancy gloves, though, where's my teeth there? So there's not a trace of red. Swing me, now look ahead, Louis. That cat disappeared, dear. After drawing out all of his heart and cash, Yes, did I boy do something right? That's going. Yeah, yeah, Jenny Diaper. I said about it, Linya. A silky tundra, sweet Lucy Brown. Oh, the line burns come the right there. I said out of my head. What about the movie, the, the, the High Society movie? I mean, we see it all the time. It always gets repeated once a year. Or... Yeah. And what Bing, if... Bing Crosby was great, you know. Yeah. Whenever Bing would come on the set, yeah. with his, when he had his golf yeah. club in his hand, you yeah. know, we were in for an early night, because maybe about uh, 11 o'clock, Bing yeah. would, you see Bing fooling around with his golf club. Yeah. He said, the hell with it, everybody go home. Yeah. Uh, here's a, a, here's a, a, a movie that's costing maybe $100,000 a day. You know, he just said, everybody go home. I'm going, he went out to the golf course. That's right. <laughs> that was in that uh, Glenn Miller story. That was um, Jimmy Jimmy's Stewart. Chip, James Stewart. James Stewart, it? yeah. And all that. Was that fun to make that movie? Oh, uh, yeah, we did We did that part in three days. You did know? you? And on the set with Gene Cooper and Louie and uh, what's the drama? Ben had the Pollock. Barbecue, ben Pollock. Uh, it, it was it was like a circus on that band from the stage, you know, and yeah. the, the director said, my goodness, I didn't know Louie was this type of uh, uh, guy, because Louis was, he was sharp, man. The jokes were coming mile a minute, the band was on the stage, you know. You know how, how it takes time to set up the, the sets and the, the, get the smoke in for the nightclub scene we were supposed to be kind of in. And man, the judge were flying and Gene Krupa was, was telling jokes. And by the time they shot the scene, man, the, the band was stoned out of their skull, and all the cast, the cameraman was stoned. Louis got everybody stoned.
Before a concert, as the audience assembles for the serious business of the evening, the musicians can relax backstage and prepare in an atmosphere of friendly badinage. Did you read the magazine? They, they said uh, Barrett could be mistaken for a college professor. That was uh, one of the weird statements of all time. If they, if they could mistake him for a college professor. <laughs> Dolly hit, you know, it's a funny thing. We were playing at the Sh at the Shaperie in Chicago, the nightclub. So on our off day, we got a call from Blaze to say, you're flying into to New York to record. Uh, so, okay, we flew into New York and we got to the studio. They handed Louis the sheet music, you know. And Louis was very angry. He said, you mean to tell me you brought me in all the way from Chicago for record this bull, you know? So, you know, Louis was, uh, was a stone professional. Yeah, right. So we recorded it, we made the date, and then we left Chicago after the engagement, and we were out in our way on Nebraska doing some one-nighters. So every night, you know, we were playing, and the artists would start shouting, hey, hello, Dolly, hello, Dolly. So Louis said, yeah. and Billy said, what's this hello, Dolly? So Billy said, you remember that record date we did a few months ago in Chicago? Said one of the tunes was called Hello, Dolly. And it says from a Broadway show. So we sent to New York for the sheet music and we rehearsed it. And and when we played it on the first on the played it on the first concert, pandemonium broke out. And that was the beginning because the, the record had hit and we were so far out in the sticks that we didn't even know that it was a hit record, you know. So Louis made that record. That show was a bomb. Yeah, it was closing. It, it was, was dying. They, really? they, they put the he notice up. He saved that show. Really? They put the and, notice and, and up. And they've and done it with uh, many road companies. Yeah, there was a real egg. I still got to play yet. <laughs> twice a year for the General Electric Convention. Yeah. Uh, the president of General Electric, he, uh, he loved City. Donald Bart and he loved Louis Armstrong. Atlantic City. Atlantic City. Atlantic City. We, yeah. we play that uh, for the big convention every year. And, the, and the, the, the president of General uh, Electric would fly anywhere from the world just to hear Louis and Gallum Bart two bands together play when the Saints go marching in. <laughs> he would fly from all over the world just for that. <laughs> hear the two bands play when the Saints go marching in, then he would split. <laughs> <laughs> he would leave immediately, you know. I kept plugged in somewhere else. Yeah, believe me when I tell you. <laughs> For 
For Barrett Deans, who had been so close to Louis, both as a player and as a friend, Pops' death came as a total shock. To him, as with so many others, Louis had already become the legend in his own lifetime. Well, when he died, I just couldn't believe it. I figured a guy like that is like uh, something in a mist that just shouldn't die. But I only cried for three guys in my life when they died. My father, Louis, and Jane Krupa. Krupa was a very good friend of mine. And when Louis died, I felt real bad. So they came around to me, the TV people came into Chicago. So they did one TV show in the lobby, and then they did one in my uh, daughter's home. They came in and, you know, talked about Louis, because I was the only guy from Chicago. So it was a sad thing. I never did get to go to the funeral in New York. But I felt like I lost somebody in my family. Because I never looked at him with color. He was just, a, to me, a musician like me. I'm a musician. I don't want to know anything about anything but eat, sleep, and play.
Greville Shaw, like Barrett Deans, was hit very hard by Louis' death. The memories remain as vivid as ever. Working with Lewis was like working for a head of state. We made at, at least one around the world tour every year. We played for kings, queens, presidents, prime ministers, popes. He rose from, he was born rather, the grandson of a slave, and he, were, he rose to be a world figure and a multimillionaire. But during that time, he still remained a very human, human being. It's a very easy thing to say what Louis has given music, and it's very difficult because the man was a, a giant. What I can say is that the, the 25 years that I spent with him, you become very close, even though it, it was a relationship of employer and an employee, you know. But it was, it was more than that with the band because you spent 25 years and we lived, we ate together for all this time. And we, we had close experience. Many times we were almost killed in plane crashes, you know, accidents, things like that. And you go through this, you become close, not, not kissing cousins, but you know, you, you developed a, a very close relationship. So uh, it, it was like that with me, you know. And then when Louis died, that was one of the most depressing weeks of my life, you know. You know, and well, before that, you know, his last job I was I was with him was at the Waldorf Astoria in New York at the Empire Room, and to see this once great giant had to have him on the stage. You know how you're very feeble. You know, the doctor told him not to do it, but Louis, he was going to do it, and and he, you know, and just barely he could hardly play. Maybe he could mm, hit one or two notes, and then he could sing. But he would go on the stage and do this two and a half hour show. And we, the house band was led by drummer Don Lemon, used to be with Woody Herman's band. Well, he was the leader of the house band. They had a big 16-piece show band there, you know. And they had all these hardened New York musicians. We used to call them the thugs, you know. That's how hard, you know. And, but they're all jazz musicians and good musicians, you know. The guys that you think that nothing can faze them. And I look back and the Louis would go, especially every night we would end the show with the tune we just finished playing, What a Wonderful World, you know and his voice was clear, but he did it with such emotion. And I look back at the band, these guys would be like this, and tears running down, you know. So that was one of the worst two weeks. But anyway, after, after the funeral was over, I went home and I, was, I felt very, I just felt terrible. I just felt as if I lost my, my own family, you know. So I started putting on some of Louis' tapes and records. And, uh, After all these years, you know. And this uh, band that we've got, I think that Louis would be tickled to death if he ever had this band, because it is a hell of a band, you know. And I think Louis would have loved it. But Keith does a hell of a job. He's the closest thing I've heard to Louis. Really. I've been in the business for 40 years, man. This is one of the best bands I've played with, and I mean that sincerely. So, gentlemen, 
That's one of the reasons the, the, the tour has worked this so well, you know. Because uh, we are following in the true tradition of the All-Stars, you know, and you couldn't do that without a lead trumpet. And I think Keith does a, a great job. Thank you.